So I would like to um, see if anybody here on the panel wants to address some uh, more issues. How do we deal with the fact that these women actually risk their lives to some extent? Uh, how do we make sure uh, that everybody knows what they're doing? As Melissa said, maybe you know, it's not enough to just uh, do some counseling. Maybe what we're doing here is, is part of the process. Um, how do we make sure that this is, and I think that became very evident here, uh, not just a transaction, uh, but more of a relationship? Um, and uh, and how do we minimize the risk as well and make, make sure that everybody's aware of it? So, uh, risk. Um, Ron and, uh, and John mentioned uh, several of us were in Paris. And today is kind of like preaching to the converted. I, I don't, I, I don't want to overemphasize this, but in many, many parts of the world, and uh, it's particularly we, we saw face to face in, in France, uh, surrogacy is of any kind, straight, any surrogacy, any third party reproduction was very, very culturally, almost nationally perceived as exploitative, um, if in some ways abusive, like selling along, that these are wealthy people for one reason or another who are paying poor women to do risky things for the sole benefit of the, the people utilizing them, and truly using them. And obviously nobody could be here today and have any notion remotely close to that because every one of us you know, from our different contexts has spoke about the, the wonderful, empowering uh, experiences that everybody in the process gets. But I think that the risk still remains and ultimately even a highly, highly motivated, wonderful carrier is taking some risk and it, it definitely is the responsibility of each of us and probably more than anyone, the physician and the, and the medical team to define and minimize and control those risks by both informed consent at the very beginning. Fertility drugs that, that Melissa took have risks. The, the, the ovary can twist and the ovaries can hyperstimulate and the ovaries can rarely, rarely become infected. Um, every pregnancy has complications and twins have more than singles. So the surrogates are, are stepping up and though they're getting a lot out of it, um, they're putting themselves at risks. And those risks really can't be Ignore those risks have to be defined and they have to be accepted and probably most importantly have to be controlled. They could be minimized, they can't go away altogether, but I think the dialogue that, that goes on in the United States is much, much more open about that and we're finding in other parts of the world that don't really understand how integrated the donors and the carriers and informed they are of the process. Um, uh, it's easy from the outside to think that these are women who of course are not, but who appear to be in some ways being taken advantage of. So I think as, as a field, every one of us up here is very, very committed to, to addressing that. And hopefully from some of the things you may have learned today, you have that perspective as well to share with the, the people in your lives who, who may or may not wonder that or may or may not question that. Can I just say, one of the things that I get um, comments on the most in the traditional surrogate is that they, and they say it in the nicest possible way so that it sounds like a compliment. Oh gosh, I don't know how you could give up your children. Implying that I'm at the same time completely wonderful and totally heartless. Um, and I think that if you are not comfortable doing it, and that you are not comfortable taking one of those children into your families like you are, and, and, and they are, um, that you shouldn't be doing this that this is not the thing for you because it's not going to be comfortable for you and it's not going to be a comfortable fit and it's going to make you a horrible surrogate. Um, but it was something that I always knew that I could do, that I was comfortable with, especially since I knew that I would know these children. I, I don't feel motherly towards them, but it's important to me to know them. I wanted to address, I, I, every surrogate has been said to this and sometimes in awe and sometimes you can tell it's, the snarkiness comes out. I can't believe I, I can't believe you could do that. And then it's almost always followed with, "I could never do that." Yes. And oh. sometimes it's it's so in the, wow, you're amazing. I could never do that. And sometimes it's, I could never do that. So you let your surrogate know the best answer, the one that will shut them up every time is, "It's okay. I've been told I have a more giving heart than most people." You should feel that. <laughs> I was going to say, one more thing I wanted to address really quick is, is the whole uh, risking our lives um, because every pregnancy 
You know, it, it is a risk, um, just that some things are worth it. So, simple as that, sorry. <laughs> I also think that while you're hearing a lot of positive stories here, that you should also know that it's not, it, it's not all the time that everybody is going to have, um, you start the relationship hoping that you're going to have a great relationship with your surrogate and that it's going to continue on. But sometimes, and I'm sure every agency has experienced this, the people don't like each other by the end. Sometimes it doesn't go as well as it goes up here, so you shouldn't be feeling self-doubt, or if you don't get along perfectly with your surrogate and want to be her lifelong friend, or maybe she doesn't want to be your lifelong friend. Maybe you called her every single minute and questioned what she was eating and drinking, that she felt you were just too neurotic, and she doesn't want to continue the relationship. You should feel that there will be enough people in the world that will love you and be able to explain and be the woman influence over your children, that it is Although a lot of people do have relationships like they are up here, believe me, if they didn't like each other, they wouldn't be volunteering to be on the panel. So you don't have every aspect being shown here of what can happen and how relationships can get more tense. And just bear in mind that this isn't the result that everybody is going to have and that if you don't have that, it doesn't mean that your children are going to have a worse upbringing or be loved any less. You want a baby. She wants you to have a baby. That's why she's doing it. I have 300 women who apply every month for 15 spots to be a surrogate with us. They're vying more than you are for one of those positions. These are people just like Christy who are just amazing women who really want to give this and it's like a calling for them. So this is not, I walk into France where it's illegal and I don't care, arrest me. This is stupid. You just don't get it. Um, my son talked at his bar mitzvah about fear, and ignorance leading to prejudice. Get to know these women. Get to know these people. Every one of us has done surrogacy or some form of assisted reproduction in these agencies because we personally are just so caught up in how fabulous this experience is. And to turn to a total stranger and do the most intimate thing creates a relationship that is lifelong and extraordinary. And so this is not something I feel is immoral in any way, shape, or form. It's, I think, good to address the notion of female influences in the children's lives. Because um, we thought a lot about it, um, given the route we were taking, and, and Vicky's in California and we're here. But, you know, we come from big, loving families, and they have aunts and grandparents, and I think there are ways, and I think it's important to actually think it through for you, for yourself, about ways to have female influences in their lives. Um, it is not um, a notion of there is no mother, but I, I tell you, one of the biggest fears we had when we were having a daughter was like, okay, how do you clean all that? I haven't been down there in 30 years. Um, uh, how, do you, how, how are we going to talk to a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old when that moment comes? And we're petrified thinking about something a decade away and sort of giving yourself a moment to say, okay, barring anything else, Aunt Kathy, you're in charge of this if we freak out. And it, it was, it was it, thinking through the female influences for us was a part of our process. Um, I, I, having a 16 and 17 year old, I would comment that depends on the kid. Um, I have one child who has always sought out female influences from my mother, from my sister, from his teachers, and the other one who couldn't care less. Um, and the best book I ever bought my parents, my kid, sorry, was not the book that said uh, one dad, two dads, brown dad, blue dads, or king and king, but the book that had what daddies do best on one side and what mommies do best on the other side, and it was the same thing. Literally, the only thing a dad can't do that a mom can do is breastfeed and give birth. And most of the people coming to surrogacy can't do that either, even the heterosexual ones. I just wanted to address uh, what Nick had mentioned about being terrified to speak to, you know, the daughter at that time. It is no less terrifying for a mother. <laughs> Don't feel bad. I, I was petrified when that moment came with my daughter. I just didn't want to talk about it because it involved, you know, well, sex, and huh, hello, I don't have sex. I don't, <laughs> I don't even know if that's quite what I did then, but you know, it's, it's just as terrifying. Uh, I wanted to share something from 
the perspective of kids, you know, needing a mom or needing a dad. Um, two things. One is there is a pretty good sized body of research about this very topic, and you can access it at familyquality.org. Um, and the research overwhelmingly supports the notion that kids really don't need uh, a mom and a dad or two of anything, that really they just need uh, loving, stable, nurturing adults in their life. So that's the research end. The other um, thing I wanted to mention, I, I have two daughters who are 12 and 15, and we used a sperm donor, anonymous sperm donor for both of them. And, um, and I, I think what's really important, and uh, I can't stress enough, is really being honest and open and develop, in developmentally age-appropriate ways as your kids grow up, because what, the kids aren't born with an idea that they're supposed to have one of each or anything. They do see images usually starting in school, but if you've already done a good job with your kids, um, you know, that's just going to be someone else's story, and they're helping them really understand that there are lots and lots of stories. My kids both have beautiful green eyes, and often people will say, oh, who don't know us, so your, your dad must have green eyes, and they, they will look at you like you're a Martian, and, and without missing a breath say, well, we don't have a dad, but the donor, we understand our, our sperm donor does have beautiful green eyes, and that's probably where we got them. And they've been saying that since they were, you know, really little kids, and it's funny, but it's also true. And they say it without shame, without discomfort. Um, in fact, they will shame you to the ground if you go in a different direction and try to you tell them they must have a dad or you know all that stuff. The donors, their dad. I mean, they they will go up against anyone. So it's really just you know, in terms of the ethics of having a family that doesn't have a dad or doesn't have a mom, um, it's it's really about being honest and open and creating a strong foundation for your kids with whatever family they have.